Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Shivan Karta from Stockholm Environment Institute, who's been working on what is known as greenhouse development rights. That's right. Shivan, good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Shivan, the climate change negotiations, of course, are completely deadlocked at the moment. So you're not going to discuss that. That's Let's true. discuss <laughs> what is your core of your work. That how do you see the global climate crisis and what is it that countries have to do? And in this, the framework that you have built, what is the responsibility of the developed countries? I think the question itself really has to be posed in the context of what the climate system and climate scientists are telling us, which is that we really are in a state of emergency. Um, we're at a point where climate has already started to change, damages are already starting to be felt, um, impacts on development are already very real to many people, whether it's floods or droughts or increasing food insecurity. And given that, it means that a dramatic response is necessary, a response that involves fairly radical reductions in emissions, particularly in the North, but actually globally. And of course, that has to be seen in the context of the larger crisis of development that still is occurring around the world where the majority of the world is still struggling for basic energy needs. So how do you reconcile those two, those two seemingly irreconcilable um, demands, reduce emissions and expand energy services? And so um, the sort of process of thinking that, that my collaborators and I have gone through is to, from the very start, think of burden sharing in the climate regime in the context of development. And think of a burden sharing arrangement or regime that would acknowledge that the majority of the world is still poor and seeking energy services, but the, and that would, that would shield that, that group from the costs of this rapid and, and, and uh, fairly radical transition. So that was sort of the basic thought. How do we, how do we allocate costs in a way that shields this group? And so there's very interesting, you know, long-term studies about the sort of levels of income that people need to attain before they achieve those basic energy services. So we look through that to try and think about, okay, who is this group that should be shielded? How large are they? And what is their population in each country? Um, and of course, the, the results are, are helpful in terms of having numbers and having analysis, but they're entirely unsurprising in terms of, of the basic intuitions of ours that they accord with. There's a vast majority of poor people in the South. There's a vast majority of wealthy, middle class, consuming class in the North. Um, and then there's, there's a minority of emerging middle class in the South, in India and in China and in other countries. And, a group that's sizable in numbers, uh, in terms of absolute numbers, maybe you know, 80 million, 100 million in India could be called part of the consuming class. Maybe a couple hundred million in China could be called part of the consuming class. And then the majority of Europe, of the US. But Shivan, if we look at from the Princeton study, which talks about one billion emitters, yeah. India really figures in one, two million in that sense of emitters who really are causing, according to the Princeton study, the global... Exactly. The it's, it's, it's a few crisis. million and then depending on, on the, what you call high emitters, what you call low emitters, it may be higher or lower, but that's right. It's a small percentage of the Indian population. Really high emitters in that sense. Of the really high emitters, that's right. And similarly for the Chinese population. And so let's take those, those people, that group of people in India and in China, in the US and e, in the EU, and talk about what is their capacity to reduce emissions and um, equally what is their responsibility for having contributed to the climate problem. Let's look at, at, at those subpopulations, the people who have risen to a certain level of development, they've met their basic energy needs, they've overcome these, you know, these classic plagues of poverty like no access to health care, no access to education, uh, low uh, uh, life expectancy, high infant mortality. Take this group of people and calculate what's their potential to contribute to solving this problem. And 
you can run through a fairly simple, fairly straightforward exercise to compare countries on that basis. And again, you end up with results that are not too surprising, but very helpful in terms of trying to talk in a very specific, quantitative way about what each country should be contributing to the problem. And if you look as a fraction of total global income above this sort of minimum level of development, or total global emissions to this contribution to the stock above this level of consumption, you see that the U.S. has you know, a large fraction. Despite its population of 5% of the global average, it has about one-third of the total global capacity and responsibility. The EU um, has about 25%. And then China, despite being one-fifth of the world's population, has about 5% contribution to the world's capacity and responsibility. India, also being one-fifth of the world's population, has you know, something like half a percent of contribution to the stocks and, and income. So let's think about obligations to the world, obligations to a climate regime, obligations to solving the climate problem in terms of those kinds of allocations of the burden a third to the US, a quarter to the EU, you know, a few percent to China, almost nothing to India. And use that as a basis for talking about emissions efforts, mitigation efforts. So what you're saying is that the world needs to cut emissions globally at a certain rate. And if it has to cut at that rate, this is the amount of money that is required. And that money really is to be built with a, a fund, transfer fund if you will, in which each country pays either actually or notionally in terms of the mitigation effort required based on the past em emissions it has done, historical emissions and its capability at the moment depending on the uh, income levels either in purchasing power parity or in actual terms income levels there that these two are really going into that so-called notional fund which will pay for this mitigation effort. Have I understood you that's, correctly? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and I also would put it in terms of a notional fund. Um, in many cases, the mitigation would happen domestically. It wouldn't need to be channeled through an external fund. Um, in many cases, a fund, a multilateral fund that's properly managed and has appropriate governance would be the appropriate way. In other ways, maybe between particular countries, trading may be a workable way, an acceptable way. Leaving out the mechanism of the transfer, but as you said, exactly. that domestic transfers would be basically notional transfers because they take place within the economy. Yeah. Other transfers are real transfers which would have to be made with some mechanism. Exactly. What is the, the size of this transfer we are talking about, say cumulative up to 2050, or per year? The um, estimates of the total cost of a very serious program of climate stabilization, they range. There's a wide range because basically nobody really knows. We've never done this before. We don't know how rapidly the technologies was, will advance and, and how quickly economies will be able to adapt. That's why but, I said one scenario. One, so, you know, so typically estimates scenario. are maybe a few percent of gross world product. So let's take the year 2020, when gross world product will be something on the order of $100 trillion. So a few trillion dollars of cost per year by 2020. Two trillion, three trillion per year. Um, so, and a significant fraction of that, uh, those costs would be provided by transfers from the north to the south. So compare that few trillion dollars to the numbers that are now being politically discussed. The Copenhagen Accord um, and its sort of formal official adoption through the Cancun Agreements um, suggested that the North would work toward mobilizing 100 billion, 0 0.1 trillion by 2020. That is a sum that would be allocated to both adaptation and mitigation. So maybe half of that would go toward mitigation. Um, so 0 0.05 trillion compared to what may be a trillion or more that would actually be needed. We know that in the United States, for example, the types of emissions cuts that are on the table that are politically seriously being talked about range from a few percent 
below 1990 levels by 2020 to 0%. Um, actually to a significant rise above 1990 levels. No effort whatsoever to a bit of effort. Um, but if you take the kind of approach that, that uh, we've been discussing, it would suggest much greater cuts, clearly. Um, cuts that are something, or uh, mitigation effort, that's something more like 60% below 1990 levels by 2020 continuing to increase 100% by 2025 and 130% by 2030. So numbers that are much beyond, much beyond what is politically considered realistic today. And actually much beyond what could be taken, undertaken solely through domestic action. Implying some of the action would have to be domestic. The US has to cut emissions, but a large fraction, perhaps a half, maybe even more than half, uh, would be undertaken through this type of international uh, mechanism for providing finance and technology to other countries, developing countries, that also need to undertake cuts, but not necessarily by providing their own finance. So Shiva, looking at these numbers, there's really no political appetite in the developed world today to go anywhere near these figures. How do you think the situation can change? Because that's really the the trillion dollar question, if I may say. How can the situation change? I don't know. I don't know how it can change, but I know precisely how it cannot change. And it will not change if people aren't talking about what the actual uh, obligation of the North to the world and to the South is. And there is such a tremendous willingness to, um, uh, to simply accept political reality in the US as an immutable um, object. Um, and to accommodate to it. The Tea Party as an immovable barrier. Exactly. Against the climate as an irresistible force. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I put my money on the climate. <laughs> I think that the Tea Party will give before the climate gives. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> my pleasure. So what you're saying is the climate has to take a hand <laughs> That's if right. climate That's change right. negotiations That's right. have to proceed <laughs> yes. meaningfully. Yes. yes. The worst case scenario that may be the best case scenario is that we see climate change fairly rapidly <laughs> and focused on uh, the, the locuses of power like Washington, D.C. Large typhoons and hurricanes <laughs> exactly and so on. Right. Unfortunate <laughs> events as it were. Exactly. But in the current But preferable crisis, to the large typhoons hitting Bangladesh or drought Could hitting sub That depends on if you are in Washington or in Bangladesh. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the powers that be are sitting in Washington. Yes. Thank you very much, Shivan. Right. We'll come back to you on this as, as it unfolds and we'll see how it goes. Okay, my Thank pleasure. You Thank you for having me.